who is John Berger and why do we care? Pig Earth, Monica, Pig Earth. What's that? Um, what is this book? Pig Earth. Um, we all read this book together in the Uva province between 2020 and 2023. The very eventful years in the history of Sri Lanka that you all lived through as well. And we're looking forward to sharing with you, all three of us, about what, why, why, do we, why are we reading this book of all books? Why are we reading John Berger? Um, just to give a little small background before we see the film, um, I think something that's been in the news in Sri Lanka recently that has been a hot topic is the Booker Prize. Um, so if you go home, if there's only one thing you take away from John Berger and you can't commit to reading Pig Earth, you can go and look up online his acceptance prize, sorry, his acceptance speech for winning the Booker Prize in 1972. Um, I won't spoil it for you, it's only about two pages long, uh, but it shows you what kind of caliber this person is. He's not your average posh British uh, literary prize winner. Um, and he's proved this throughout his life uh, with a lot of different, very diverse projects. He may be most well known as an art critic. If you want to sort of slam him in a category, he's a Marxist art critic. And he's most known for his book and the movie's Ways of Seeing. Um, but maybe his least known work, uh, I think, from my, is uh, sort of this latest phase. And it's how he spent the, the end of his life. Um, this guy from London, uh, from this very erudite, literary sphere uh, goes and lives with the last of the French peasantry. Um, what does he do there? He writes a trilogy, and if the trilogy is very unique. This book, we're just going to deal with the first book of the trilogy. It contains poetry and also political economy. It contains ethnography, but it's not your normal ethnography because it sort of goes back and forth between first person and third person fiction and nonfiction. You're not sure if he's telling you some story that some old woman told him, or if it's conveyed three parts removed. You you can't you can't really tell. What you can tell is his absolute uh, commitment as a human being from the heart to um, share these stories and this way of life, which is disappearing in France and around the world. I think I'll leave it at that as an introduction to Berger, just to give it some Sri Lanka. I think hopefully it's obvious how that could be relevant in the mountains of Sri Lanka today. Uh, but we'll go throughout today's session and we'll show a clip. Uh, and then you'll get to hear from, from the rest of us. The majority of people living in the world today are peasants. And the vast majority of all the women and men who ever lived were also peasants. But now this is changing. And it's estimated that in 10 years' time, in the 1980s, more than half the people in the world will be living in cities and no longer peasants. Now, this very radical transformation of the world isn't much thought about here. To understand the significance of this transformation, we perhaps have to grasp something about what constitutes peasant experience. Most exhibitions of photographs remove the images from the living context in which they were taken. Here, Jean Moore has tried to take photographs on behalf of the photographed. Although, as we'll see, the interests of the photographer and those photographed don't always coincide exactly. One day, the wife of Gaston the woodcutter stopped me in the village and said, I wonder if your friend, she meant John Moore, could take a photograph of my husband. Because when he's killed in the forest, I won't have anything to remember him by. Jean followed the sound of the chainsaw and eventually found Gaston in the forest. 
He's paid by the cubic meter of wood stacked on the side of the forest road for the lorries to take away. When he heard about his wife's request, he shrugged his shoulders. And then he added, but if you take some pictures to show what the work is like, okay. Next day, I saw Gaston, and he said, there's a big one I'm felling first thing tomorrow, and Jean should be there. You'll be able to see this one fall within 20 centimeters of where I want it, he said to Jean. When Jean showed him the printed photographs of the tree falling, Gaston said, these are the kind of photos I've been dreaming of during 20 years of wood cutting. There's a village saying, to go into the forest is like going to war. It seems to me that in the photo which Jean gave to Gaston's wife, the tension of working in the forest for which he has a passion, is to be seen in his face. And now his wife has this photograph, in which, in a strange way, she already sees, in the very tensions of his life, his possible death. We look at still photographs like we look at no other images. When we're looking at a film, we live in imagination in the time of that moving film. When we look at a photograph, however recent, we are looking at a moment from the past. Film confers a kind of immortality. All photographs are a reminder that everything passes. This photograph is the key to the peasant economy of our village. In the books on the windowsill of the cooperative dairy are marked the quantities of milk that each family delivers morning and evening. For nine months of the year, a cow supplies milk which can be sold. On average, a good cow gives about 10 liters of milk a day. All the year's work in the fields is in order to feed the family and the cows. It is a civilization of milk. The farmhouses are made from stone and wood. They look large because the hayloft, the stable and the family are all under the same roof. The family is the peasant working unit and they work together to produce food for the family in order to survive. In addition, they have to produce food for others. But they are not agricultural laborers. They don't depend on wages.
the harshness of peasant life in the past is beyond our imagination today. Nobody could wish that such a life continue in the future as it was in the past. Peasants were a class of survivors, that's to say most of them succumbed, victims of accidents, famine, disease, fire, crop failure, war, marauding enemies, and those who came from the cities to take the first and largest part of what the fields produced. It was often only a minority who survived. Those who remained were cautious, cunning, indefatigable, and philosophical. Their philosophy cannot be put quickly and simply into words, but something of its spirit is still visible in some faces. The faces of mountain peasants all over the world have something in common. They look carved as if in wood from their own forests. Mountain peasants recognize the precariousness of life. Life is a brief stay on a precipitous slope, and they have a sense of humor and of the absurd. I work in the stable and fields with our neighbors, who are now friends, but I remain a stranger. There's another photograph of me, the one in my passport, and this means that I can leave, I can travel, I can choose where I want to be. No peasant can do that. A peasant no more chooses a job than he chooses the village to be born in or the weather on a particular day. Work, place, weather, birth, death are all part of the same thing which you have not chosen. All choices are small. The most important is to accept what is necessary either well or badly. And that choice involves self-respect. Economists and agricultural experts have evolved a plan according to which peasants in many parts of the world will soon disappear. It takes centuries or millennia to make a peasant tradition, but peasants with their tradition can be eliminated in one generation. Now the question is, will the system that is replacing them, the system of multinational agribusiness, feed and cultivate the world better? In Europe, one of the ways in which peasants are being eliminated is through mechanization. Machines can now do work which once broke the backs and crippled men and women alike. Yet those machines cost so much that only companies or banks, not peasants, can afford them. One of the stories is about a man called Marcel, not the same Marcel as the photo. His son buys him a second-hand tractor but he doesn't want to use it. He doesn't want to become addicted to it. One day, when haymaking, he tells himself why. On top of the hay, he again explained the machines to himself. They make sure we know the machines exist. From then onwards, working without one is harder. Not having the machine makes the father look old-fashioned to the son, makes the husband look mean to the wife, makes one neighbor look poor to the next. After you have lived a while with not having the machines, they offer you a loan to buy a tractor. A good cow gives 2,500 liters of milk a year. 10 cows give 25,000 liters a year. The price you receive for all that milk during the whole year is the price of a tractor. This is why you need a loan. When you have bought the tractor, they say, now, to use the tractor fully, you need the machines to go with it. We can lend you the money to buy the machines, and you can pay us back month by month. Without these machines, you're not making proper use of your tractor. And so then, you buy a machine, and then another, and you fall deeper and deeper into debt. And eventually, you're forced to sell out, which is what they planned from the very beginning in Paris.
he pronounced the name of the capital with contempt and recognition in that order. Everywhere in the world, men go hungry. Yet a peasant who works without a tractor is unworthy of his country's agriculture. Day by day, the peasants make the economists sigh, the politicians sweat, and the strategists swear defeating their prophecies and plans all over the world, in Moscow, in Washington, Peking and Delhi, Cuba and Algeria, the Congo and Vietnam. A forlorn, nameless hue contrasts gloomy gutter trails, syncopated rains augment, nauseous mornings mist and dew. The spluttering vapor, chronic cough, persistent wheeze, Unmistakable betrayal, the forest now awake, but ill at ease. Limp canopy dripping, suffocating sludge, noxious acridity, visceral impediment to inspiration, breath of life leaves souls lost, mouldering in humidity. Hissing and spitting firewood in the half, distressed limbs bleeding back to earth, interminable drubbing of tree abodes, Gaudy debris clog and congest, dams of streaking plastic, torrents of waste. As the soil erodes, chemicals now cascade the fields, overburdened, cut back, destroyed, the land and her people toil. Belligerent economic interest, the toxic yields, supermarket mine conditioned to appease, co-modification of all. Call to labor strikes the factory bell, the forest now awake, but ill at ease. Pelipola. The word has different etymologies. Pelipola could mean the belly market, where they sell the belly fruit. Some of the elders there also told us it could be called the place where the throats were cut. From the times of the Uva Rebellion, when Governor Brownrigg gave the order, still in writing, kill all men, cut down all trees useful to man, burn all, burn anything you can't take away with you, burn the harvest. This is a piece of marginal land in the Uva province near the village of Mirahavata, where we were living for on and off for about two and a half, three years at different times. Some of you know the story. Uh, we won't talk about it too much. It's, it was an abandoned tea estate that was purchased around 1983, I believe, by Ronald Senanayaka. Some of you may know the story. He planted thousands of trees there. Now it's a 17-acre island of forest in a sea of tea and vegetables and grassland. Um, and the three of us were living there during this exciting period of Sri Lanka's history over the last three years where so many different crises uh, have converged in this country. And we've had all kinds of different perspectives on it, whether we're talking about the pandemic or the economic crisis or the organic agriculture crisis or the Aragalaya or the agrarian crisis, uh, which as we've been discussing with Lupul is not just a recent thing, it's is where we're talking about a catastrophic health crisis uh, nationwide, uh, sometimes referred to as CKDU, but it's much broader, it's cascading and interlinked throughout the, the whole country. Also in this period, the Indian farmer protest. Um, this was all in our minds and we all argued about all of these subjects and we don't all agree on all of these subjects and that's part of the diversity of what Berger is striving at. Um, in his presentation. Um, we're not here today to tell you about analog forestry or about uh, all we've learned about uh, the plant species and the animal species, which we've also learned about those things. We're really here to tell you about our neighbors um, in the same way that, that uh, Berger was talking about the people he was living alongside. Um, and as you can tell already, this isn't the, uh, the beautiful picture of the idyllic paradise mountainside. Um, one time we were discussing, there was a line from uh, Martin Prechtel, who's a Mayan uh, American guy, and he says, uh, people who idealize village life 
obviously never had to live in one. I remember Sean was said we should write that on the wall here. <laughs> um, but it's also something it's also something you come to love and have deep respect and appreciation for. And you go back to your urban life and you want to use something smells wrong, something smells different. Um, so we're not here to, I think in some of the other seminars you may have gotten far better than you'll get from us a statistical analysis of the Uva countryside. Um, there's a line in uh, Eduardo Galeano, if you're familiar with him, he says, uh, where do people earn the per capita income? More than one poor starving soul would like to know. In our countries, numbers live better than people. So we're not here to give you numbers today, really. Um, Berger, but I am gonna talk a bit about political economy because this is part of Berger's book. How do these people, these peasants, these farmers, these mountain peasants, we'll talk about that, how do they fit into the global economy? But we're not here to talk about this in the abstract. Quite literally, we're here to tell you about Kanti and Nandana and Shirani and Megamali and Nuan and Nisansala and Ramesh and a few dozen others as the circle expands of our neighbors. Um, these people are living on marginal land by the definition of an agrarian uh, uh, agronomist, steep, uh, semi-forested land. Um, but for them, it's very much the cent center of the world, both in terms of their cultural lives and in terms of their ritual mystic lives. Um, they are small producers, small holders, small producers, but they are very much connected to a very big global economy. Um, they are subsistence farmers to an extent. They have home gardens uh, to varying extents, but they are also producing surplus. And this small surplus that they produce, once again, is linked into a global economy. One of the key aspects of the similarity, which the end of this movie just, just touched on, is the question of mechanization. And, you know, Berger, when he goes in the 70s, 80s to um, this French Alps, he finds the last peasants in Europe, and why, why are they still there? You know, why are these the last ones? And it's because of their land. The land is so steep, he describes in the book, that you have, you can, there are places where you could fall and die. <laughs> you know, the, the tractors can't get there. Um, and this is similar to these parts of the Uva province where we've been living. The, the, you can't do really tractor, can't really bring the tractors in there. And this means that there's a way of life that is preserved to some extent. Um, here, there are people who work with their hands, without machines. It's difficult to find. You can't find this in the United States. You can't find this in Europe. People who work with their hands, directly with, with, the, with, the, with the soil, with the rocks, with the dirt, with the crops. They have tools, but it's not, uh, there's no combine harvesters. Uh, there's, I, mean, I don't know how many chainsaws there are in the village, maybe one in the whole village, maybe two. Um, so they're unmechanized. But they are chemicalized. Um, so Berger predicts, you know, this way of life is going extinct, but the peasants are here a little bit longer. But in the meantime, the monopoly corporations have bought up and divided the whole supply chain of food from seed to harvest. And uh, even if you are up there in the small mountain corner, you are connected to that. These are the people who made your, cal your calendar that hangs on your wall in your house from the agribusiness companies that give you your calendars. These are the people that uh, mediate your relationship with the, with the market economy. Um, they also have Wi-Fi or fiber optic, a lot of these families. So there's a new element here, which isn't accounted for, and I think this is sort of a, is a new element of so-called peasant studies, is that now there's access, potentially, to a global information exchange, um, which changes the situation. In this village, um, there's also a quarry um, where trucks trundle by at all hours of the day to blast the, a mountain into gravel. Um, so the economy, if you were gonna sort of make four overlapping circles, you could have you know, the home garden, um, which is fruit trees, some medicine, uh, a little bit of vegetables. Then you've got your commercial production, which you would do for a wage, which will be uh, maybe you're working in the tea, uh, maybe you're doing commercial vegetable production, or maybe you're working in the quarry, or you have some gig in town, um, or what passes, you know, that 
the junction more than the town, the Hondia. Um, or you can go to the city. Um, or there's kind of like all over the world, there's a bit of an underworld, you know. And so these are this is the sort of geopolitical economy of the small village. And in this village, there's the Maupolta Primary School of about uh, I don't know. It looks like about a hundred kids. Um, and one wonders what these children are going to do. How many of them will become farmers? How many of them will go to the cities? Um, how many of them, if they want to get married, what kind of job will they want to have? What kind of family economy are they going to want to set up for themselves? Um, that's sort of the, the overall political economy picture of, of who these people are. And how do we define them? And I think I'll dwell on this a bit because we've been hearing this word peasant studies, well, peasant studies. And I did a little work this morning with the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, what is this word? Um, and it's, it's quite a story with just the definitions of these words. I think these days you hear the word peasant, it's a, it even says, if you look in the online dictionary, it says derogatory, right? You wouldn't want to call somebody a peasant. So I was thinking peasant must come from peon, it must come from that kind of a Latin root, but it actually, it's come from Old French, Old English, it actually is person of the countryside, pais, paisan. So how is, so in a way that tells the whole story of the last 500 years, that somehow we've arrived at a place where people from the country are, are bad, are untrustworthy, are, uh, it's, it's a term of, of, der of derogation. Um, in Sinhalese, I don't know to what extent govia translate, but people do use the phrase game in the same kind of derogatory way sometimes. You know, well, very game means not good, which means from the village. Um, another one that's even more explicit is this word nobody uses anymore, vilen, V-I-L-L-E-I-N, which is from Old English. And this is where we get the word villain. And this word comes from Latin, from the villa, the Roman villa. So a villain was someone who worked on a large Roman estate, large agricultural estate. So this could describe many people in this country or in many countries around the world. But these people over hundreds of years of writing by the urban propertied classes identified these people as the most untrustworthy, the most morally uh, suspect ones to the extent that this is our definition of like the bad guy, villain. So that in itself tells, uh, tells a story and it leaves us with a place of wondering which words to use. I'm not comfortable with the definitions that, that it's very vogue now, you would say small farmers. But if you meet some of these people, they're quite, quite larger than life. Small farmers doesn't really sound right if you've become a friend with somebody who's a so-called small farmer. There's a wonderful line in The Grapes of Wrath by Steinbeck where they, they, the, the small farmers, the peasants, are talking about the guy who is sitting on the tractor on his thousands of acres. And he says, how small must that guy feel that he needs to sit on his thousands of acres up there. It's like, that's the real small farmer, is the guy on the tractor on the thousands of acres. Um, this word, peasant studies, um, started, I mean, Berger says it's very well, you know, he's a class of survivors, class of people that are going extinct, and moreover, all our ancestors ever, no matter where you come from in the world, you have ancestors who worked the land for subsistence, and maybe to some, to some varying extent, they also produced a surplus that went to somewhere else. How is it that uh, it's not until 1972 when they have a seminar, <coughs> probably not unlike this one in London, with Berger and Theodore Shannon and a few other people, and they decide to launch it there and say, well, where, where do we fit in? And there's no academic discipline, so they have to start a journal of peasant studies which doesn't happen until 1973, that we begin to study all of our ancestors ever. So this gives us a kind of a sense of the gravity of the subject matter, um, which we very much want to ground here in Uva, in Sri Lanka, in the historical moment that we're in, but I believe touches on the whole human story. Tap the honey wine is daily operation, afresh in the foliate silence of dawn. 
Youthful movements of liveness and grace belie a face accumulated with information. Knowledge perpetual, maintained through toil and sweat. Empirical wisdom displayed. No rows or stacks of books or journals, but a reference library terraced from fertile dirt. Jungle fronds descended, cultivation of garden farm begun. Invaluable familial assistance provides all tasks sincerely tended. In spite of conducive path least resistant, no warranty on abundance. Bitches brew, flower sap perfected to temper labor subsistence. Foraging alleviates scarcity, improvising, adapting, innovating. Tree of life preserved, harvesting wisdom's ancestry. Forest, forest language forsaken by rural son and daughter, dreaming of urban luxury. Avarice and usury beckon without precaution. Uncoiled, they cephalous demon prepares for the slaughter. Who will sow the future seeds? Inner city growth seldom reaped. Simplicity and beauty disappears as subjugating commerce leads. When we review the, the literature and the history of people trying to reconcile the experience of peasant life, uh, these individuals, these individuals full of character and experience, and here we are, social scientists come around to put them in categories and understand. Um, we tend to have gotten it wrong, we tend to have missed uh, not only the sensuous experience of their lives, which we can uh, approximate through poetry, uh, but we also tend to really just get wrong the whole picture, what, what makes these people tick, what they're, how, they, how they operate. Um, Berger talks about this, how both the left, and especially in his historical afterward, which comes at the end of the book, why is it, how is it that the left and the right consistently get the questions of the peasantry wrong. And you can look at this like from the French Revolution up through the Russian Revolution to today. Um, and Berger says it's because of this word progress. He says this is an urban idea that started in modern history with the French Revolution. And uh, Berger says that this, is, this idea was born with the bourgeoisie and later it was taken up by all other revolutionary theories. And this ideology of progress is it's a different conception of time than was existing previously. It's not a cyclical or a spiral idea of time. It's this linear history. And uh, it's like even over depth, right? That's how intense this ideology of progress is. Um, on the left, we can see this triumph over death through slogans like patria muerte, like fatherland or death. You know, we'll die, but we're going to build the better future. And on the right, you sort of see the nihilist version of it in consumerism, where, you know, the whole world's going to hell, but we're just going to keep partying and uh, go into deeper debt. And, uh, you know, if, if there's any sense of a legacy at all, it's being able to pass improved conditions of consumerism on to your children and grandchildren. Um, and this ideology of progress uh, accounts for, Berger says, why both the left and the right are ready to get rid of peasants. There's a line in the Communist Manifesto, which I think is usually not read. I think it's a lot of that document is written in a sarcastic tone, but they talk about the idiocy of rural life, I've heard this phrase. And then the right wing has its more uh, vulgar ways of saying the same thing. So in addition to the ones that are getting ready to get rid of the peasants, there's sort of a new breed. I don't know if it's a new breed or it's the same people, but they're the ones that want to help the peasants. <laughs> And uh, this is the, the question of empowerment. And I just want to say something about this as well. Um, Berger has these two quotes I'm going to read about characterizing in very bald, frank, explicit terms that you can't avoid understanding what, what these people's lives are. It says, they who can feed themselves are instead being forced to feed others. They who produce the food we're the most likely to starve. So how are we going to empower these people? Well, empowerment is one of these words that's nicely vague, so you don't have to measure it. 
So, you know, we, we can all tell stories uh, about living there over the few years. There's sort of like the funny story of the person who got the NGO funding from abroad to empower the rural women, and they're looking for some rural women to empower. Or you can tell the more subtle story of anybody from an urban environment who comes and honestly has a sense of compassion with their neighbor who has a harder life than they do and they, and they want to help. I think um, we're far more likely to be empowered by some of these people uh, than we are, than they are by us. Um, are we going to empower them by imp improving their terms of trade so that when they grow food for other people, uh, they can be less likely to starve? Or is the root of peasant empowerment going to be in a totally, radically different relationship altogether? So maybe they don't have to feed other people and can just feed themselves. Our experience uh, doesn't answer these questions, but our experience is that uh, often the neighbors will show up with bags overflowing with fruit, uh, kitual wine. Um, you know, the power has gone out for the last 13 hours and they show up with firewood. They've been out there since 5 a.m. Who needs empowerment? Uh, when the lights go out, the urban people feel powerless. When the lights go out and they're kind of sort of normal, they turn off, they go to bed well, after sunset anyway, because they have to be up before the sunrise to milk the cow, etc. Um, one of the things, how did another to relate to where we are here, Berger mentions the planning in Paris. So in the same way that people in his countryside say the word Paris with contempt and recognition in that order, here in Colombo there's a similar thing going on. Um, Today, the economic planning is the same. It's to eliminate the peasantry, but there's some sort of a twist. Uh, you know this better than me, some of you, but I'll just give a, a brief ap appreciation of it. I think that uh, we're lucky in this country to have a premier head of state who's very explicit in his uh, language about what the plans are. Um, I think it can be read very, seen very clearly in his 2022 Advocata lecture. Um, lays out very clearly what the plan is for, for Sri Lanka. I'm speaking about the president. And if you want the history of that, um, I recommend another video from 1984 from the White House, where J.R. Jaiwardena is speaking with President Ronald Reagan, and they're celebrating and toasting together the birth of the free, first free trade zone in Asia. And uh, this is a continuity, for those who don't know, between governments. Uh, the young Ronald was working with Jaiwardena. And uh, you can't not say it, right? The, uh, this meeting at the White House in 1984, the significant year of 1984, was, um, began with the gift of a baby elephant named Vijaya, Victory. And this baby elephant died within six weeks, something like that. And uh, you know, the death of this baby elephant and this experience in the White House, this is not ironic, this is not a metaphor, this is not magic realism. This is the reality, and this is the plan for the peasantry of Sri Lanka. They can call it modernization. Berger treats this word, he says modernization is, um, it's about transforming peasants into totally different social and economic beings. Um, you know, there's some language uh, for this in the Marxist schools of political economy, we can call the, this plan for the country as uh, the plan of the neo-colonial comprador bourgeoisie, if you want to get technical about it. We don't, we can do that if, if that's interesting. Um, but I want to not talk too much. We can also compare the situation with India. What, what happens when you stake a country completely on industry and services and you let the peasantry sort of just write them out of history? We can also see what happened, it's like not as nightmare of a scenario, but even more uh, complete when you look at what happened in uh, France or the, or the EU or Britain, where there is no longer any peasantry of agriculture without peasantry. Um, I think maybe a good way to talk about this in Sri Lanka, if you'll forgive me, is to use the phrase that there's a specter haunting us here, and it's the specter of Singapore. It's a country without peasants. Um, it's, it's a kind of a genocide, if you want to think about it in terms of eliminating a way of life completely. 
and it's also a physical genocide if you want to think, think about it in terms of the images we saw in COVID in India with India with like people who were farmers dying on mass in the streets of the cities. Um, we need call, calling all social scientists. We need an alternative. We need an alternative development model, uh, one that's not premised on the destruction of the peasant way of life. Uh, but one that's not rooted in preserving some kind of bucolic fake image. Um, I've been searching, I think this is interesting, Charan Singh's work, India's Economic Policy, the Gandhian Blueprint. I'm not here to say this is the answer, but do we have an alternative development model to recommend other than modernization rooted on the destruction of the ancestral way of life? Um, I'd like to participate with all of you in a um, a seminar, a long-term process of creating this kind of development model. It could be a study group. Um, I'm associated with the journal Capitalism, Nature, Socialism. If the social scientists would like to, um, if we could join forces in this sense. Um, I'm going to skip Char and Singh. Excuse me. I'll just try to race to the end here. The, the whole debate has a new urgency because of the situation we're in, which we can use the word ecological catastrophe for. It's not, we can't just say climate change, we can't say, just say ocean acidification or sea level rise or soil erosion. We really have to talk about an ecological catastrophe because it's all cascading and non-linear and interlinked. Um, this forces us, as we've realized that collectively on a, as a planet, we're, we're not living correctly as a, civiliz as a global civilization, metropolitan, cap capitalist, industrialist civilization. It's not working. Every school children can tell you now it's not controversial. Um, there's a whole movement that I'm more exposed to in Latin America to get back to our roots of the indigenous people and the campesino people and the people that live with the land and know how to Relate to the relate to the land in a non in a way that doesn't destroy it and doesn't destroy each other. Um, Berger asks if we can have. He says at the end of the book, can we have an alternative political development? Is it possible that peasants should achieve a worldview of themselves as a class? This implies achieving power as a class, a power which, in being achieved, would transform their class experience and power. So I think we see things like this happening around the world, like the Via Campesina is an organization that has 200 million members. Um, we have organizations in Latin America, small organizations like the Zapatistas, which have a huge sort of political footprint, um, the Landless Workers Movement in Brazil. And, and you also have these movements that are rooted in very particular cultural forms, but have universal appeal. Like in Bolivia, they have the Red Alu. The Alu is like the traditional uh, communal property holding. Or in um, Brazil, you have the palenqueros, the, the, the maroon communities, the escaped slaves who built their own communities, but they're also practicing polyculture, farming, farming in an ecologically sustainable way. Um, I just got back last month. I was in Venezuela, where there are literally thousands of uh, people involved in hundreds of eco-socialist communes. They use this, that, that's their language, eco-socialist communes. Um, I think on a larger scale, with the work of Samir Amin, we can think geopolitically about delinking. We can think about, uh, you know, breaking the connection between the, the exploitative connection between town and country in the same way that we have to break the exploitative relationship between metropolis and periphery. Um, I'm just throwing a lot of ideas out there. We can pick these up, um, but I want to end and uh, turn it over to finalists. Um, I think what we all share in, in UVA is this idea of, or a practice anyway, of, uh, of, of appreciation for these people whose way of life is uh, fated for extinction. Like they, they've got an execution date. In the same way Berger said, in 25 years there will be no more French peasants. We can look at the data today and do predictive analytics and say on which day there will be no more uh, you know, independent subsistence producers in Sri Lanka. Um, Amilcar Cabral, uh, Guinea-Bissau, East Africa, he, he talks about, West Africa, excuse me, talks about return to the source. And I think this is something that uh, we're all approximating here. Um, the idea is that you go, you go the, the colonial elites or the elites of any country, they go, they get the education in the metropolis, in the centers of power, 
And then what do they do? They, they go home, and what should they do with this knowledge they have? And Cabral says, you have to go to the villages. Um, but you don't go there to preserve their way of life, because their way of life, like, it's unimaginably hard. Nobody would argue that they should just be working seven days a week, uh, dying young of tetanus or diabetes or whatever the conditions are people have. Um, but you also don't want to fake their whole way of life to exchange, extinction, because it's, we're not just talking about people, we're talking about cultures, uh, we're talking about a whole ethnography, a whole mystic uh, experience, a whole practice of Buddhism, of, of Islam, of Christianity, everybody, there's a whole other subversive peasant version of all of these things. Um, Berger talks about that. It's also, we don't want to go back because we want to be slaves to, to tradition. Um, Fanon, Franz Fanon says, you know, the people who are only for tradition actually end up going against their own people. It's not, it's not about going back to the past. We're not, we don't want to go back to them to empower them. We don't really think that's how it is going to work. And we don't want to go there to worship them either. Put them on our heads. As Donald says. Um, actually, we want to go there to live, um, to eat, to drink, to raise children with fresh air, um, to be able to think, to dream with fewer nightmares, and to survive. And we'll end on that, because these are the people, as Berger says, who are the experts in survival. And we're headed for a gauntlet of world war and mass extinction, and if we want to survive, we have to return to the source. One thousand polished hues, one thousand silver in tones, intimate portentous horizons. Black Eagle Angel Records, Yamato Nardeshiko, Lucy Cabral, Daughters of a Fathered Landscape, Pedomorphic Spirit Faces of the Green Golden Dawn, Precious Clothes Unfolded, Silkery, Silken Shimmering Drapery Cover the Bare Soil Resplendent, Beauty and Labour Devoted, Solar Countenance Reflected, Young Mothers of All Orishas, Yemoja, Wayengi, progenies of Ra, descend upon our fields neglected. For winds, lightning, violent storms, inhabitants of the supernal abode, avian sonata composed, a shameless simulacrum forms. Blue and green reclined in grace, supple naked limbs stretched, a plenitude within this forest, humble treasures to pluck and taste. Harmonic beauty resonates value understood by few, nurtured and sustained, the inner field cultivates. A cantata sung by few, circadian dance, suddenly self-conscious, disappears beneath seven veils. Days long past, forested gates entered with reverence, walking alone, dedicate, inadequate, persona, desolate, dreaming the dead living. I, um, in the forest, found myself very frequently coming back to Colombo. So I had a very much less immersive experience. And often on the route I traveled, I traveled behind the trucks, carrying timber, cut down trees, and stones from the quarries. So sometimes I'd be stuck behind them for hours. But I would keep coming back to the forest. So I'm going to read an excerpt from a piece that's between the quarry and the forest. And it's fiction. The lorry was less of a vehicle now, so much as a gently decaying hull, like something left too long on the ocean floor, an ill-fated vessel or the carcass of a whale. No one had dared to drive it off. The villagers knew what had happened inside that lorry what ruin had come for him when he was dragged from it by the mob, and their superstitions would not allow them to possess it. What they did was scavenge, strip it of its salvageable parts. The steering wheel that bore the soft impressions of his fingers, the tires that had once crushed a small, startled mongoose. It had shone a dazzling red in his headlights, but upon closer inspection, the creature turned out to be merely a dismal blend of dead brown and ash. And so the lorry remained for rats to nest on the dashboard, 
for creepers to curl their slim, strangling fingers around the window frames, and for rain and rust to nibble away at the black paint on the side body of the truck that proclaimed such a metal pressure. Sometimes when he permitted himself to reflect on how he wound up here, he saw neither the girl nor the mom, but a scarred face cut with such deep grooves you wondered how many ages it had seen, a face that had glared at him like a curse. He had known that face in his boyhood, when it was whole and serene, when the quarry was still a mountain, cloaked in shrubbery, crowned with trees, and marked only by the footpaths of herders, along which he had raced, shirt streaming, stones like teeth in the soles of his feet, all the way to the summit. A decade of extraction had made a beast of her, cut away the curves and contours to reveal a bare wall of menacing, flashing slab rock. The sun hit her full in the face and she sucked it all in before flinging it back tenfold, scorching. The laborers who toiled there developed a kind of immunity to her, grew tougher, darker skin to withstand her heat, developed a deafness to the constant brain rattling drill of machinery that hacked and hammered all day long, pounding her into submission. Sometimes she seemed unfazed by the relentless attack of dynamite and steel, as though the tireless efforts of these men to gut her, to blow her open, were nothing more than a nuisance that would eventually cease to trouble her. Other times, she gave them help, refused to yield any part of herself, deliberately deployed her own body against the workers, detaching blades of granite and dropping them from such a height, they sliced open anything that intercepted them. Limbs, arteries, torsos. Stripped of her grasses and roots and topsoil, the bald-headed mountain could no longer contain the rains. Water ran unchecked down her ruined face and into the road, where potholes grew deeper and where oil and mosquitoes lay in undisturbed union. Dogs and children played in the dust, dodging the spray from explosions while Sajid and his friends leaned against their lorries, waiting for the labourers to fill their truck beds. Once or twice they were invited to share tea and bread under a blue tarp propped up on sticks that served as the stoneworkers' cafe. But they always declined. Very little separated the drivers from the quarry slaves. A narrow trench, a sliver of space that had to be defended in order to maintain the distinction between one man and another. At 16, Sajit was the youngest driver on the fleet. The uncles were fond of him, and the older boys took great pleasure in his initiation into their tribe. There were angels and devils among them, and they all had red smiles. Before too long, he also chewed and spat continuously. Ulcers erupted on his tongue, sprouted through the soft lining of his cheeks. The drivers compared battle scars peeling back their lips like curtains to reveal souls the size of thumbnails. When they laughed together, the sound was that of engines coming to life, a rattling chorus that he sometimes heard in his sleep. Fume and fuel, his days began and ended with it. At the shed every morning, he handed over a portion of his wages to a man who carried banknotes between his knuckles, fanned out like a peacock's tail. He transacted swiftly counted expertly, folded bills crisply into his fist, and then pumped. Five liters, ten, fourteen, fifteen, glucking through the pipe. Enough diesel to oil away his misgivings about trundling this mountain in pieces between the quarry and the stone depot in town. The drivers all plied the same route, a sawtoothed road that bordered the forest. Stories shrouded the forest like mist about a professor's mad exploits, about a demon with a dark, wet mouth waiting to close over intruders. Occasionally, if need so compelled him, a driver might stop to urinate in bushes or lob an empty can or bottle over the spike-leaved 
sentries that lined the forest's edge. Mostly, they gave it a clear birth. All that green, so luring, so lascivious. Who knew what treachery it concealed? Sajid never contradicted these views. But it had become his habit at the end of his shift to stop his lorry at the old entrance, now impenetrably overgrown, and stand at that threshold. The air was cool, and it had the quality of moving water, as though whatever was shed here might be carried away and purified somewhere downstream. Sometimes he closed his eyes and exhaled poison. And only when he was sure the forest had collected it, he filled his lungs with a fresh breath. If he lingered too long, strange compulsions arose in him, and they all entailed prostration to the forest. Not a command, never a command. More an invitation to lay his chest on the ground, to rest his cheek on the damp earth to let his forearms take his weight and then to slither forward on his belly like some enormous reptile right into the forest. <laughs>